Hi, everybody. Um, I am Steph Heatbrink. I'm the prayer team leader here at Third Church, and just going to back up a little bit more since we're in the round. Um, Hope you don't mind that I'm sitting tonight. We uh, had the joy, speaking of joy, of moving my brother uh, into his first new home this weekend. So we wrapped up about three o'clock this afternoon. And so my heart is good because there's a million answered prayers in that, but my legs are tired because I'm getting older. And so, um, so I'm going to sit tonight. And I just also ask for grace too. I feel like I've got a little bit of mush brains, but I also just have a sense that um, I just want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's interruption tonight. So whatever it is that he might actually have for us um, in this space. And so, Holy Spirit, we just give you this night. I give you this talk, Lord, and we just say, um, have your way amongst us. And so... Um, uh, I am the leader of prayer here at Third, so pretty much any time I, I speak, I talk about prayer. And so I'm going to talk about prayer tonight a little bit, some things that are on my heart. And uh, I'm going to start actually with also where we're going to end. And in, in short, it's not very flashy, um, but this has been on my heart a lot, uh, really for the, um, probably about the last nine months uh, specifically. Um, I mean, it's kind of been on my heart most of my life, but it's really uh, just been stirring in my heart that God's just really inviting us into a very, very intentional uh, season of seeking his face in prayer uh, that is also um, connected intricately to an outworking of mission. Okay, so we're going to seek his face in prayer, and I think very much tied to that is a, an outflowing of missional engagement. And um, it's not just us, uh, right? I think he's actually stirring that up all over the earth in this season, and, but it's really been kind of on my heart. And so I'm going to be uh, kind of extending some specific invitations for our community um, as we think about this next season. And you know, like I said, in, in some ways it's not super flashy, but I do think it's really biblical. And there's been this sense in this past year, especially uh, just to return to some of the simplicity of the gospel, right? Uh, prayer is very much rooted in the call to love God, right? With all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. A mission in loving our neighbor and also in the great commandment, uh, right? To bring the gospel to all nations. Those are uh, core truths at, at the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And I just feel like the Lord just keeps bringing those things right in front of my face all the time uh, right now. And so um, I hope when I unpack what's on my heart, though, tonight that you begin to, uh, to feel a bit of a stirring too. Um, you know, we have really been talking since January about the idea that word, deed, and power are kind of three of the key elements that come together in renewal. But I think tonight, I also want to unpack for us a bit uh, about how prayer is often the fuel or the spark um, that really uh, causes those things to, to happen. And I mean, if you read about revivals, if you read about renewals, so many of them um, are birthed out of seasons of intercessor, intercession, of uh, faithful intercessors. And so all of those things are very, very, very much uh, tied together. And um, if you are worshiping on Sundays with us right now, you know that in August we're in the summer of stories. And so how I'm going to talk a little bit about this tonight is I felt like I was supposed to retell a little bit of our prayer story here tonight, kind of our prayer story at Third Church. And, you know, this won't be a full uh, telling. This will be a bit of the, the retelling of things that I've been a part of and experienced here. Um, I've been here for uh, about 20 years. So I gradu graduated from Central in 2001 and came right uh, on staff in that season. And so I'm going to share a little bit from my seat on the bus of things that have unfolded amongst us because I've just been sensing the Holy Spirit say, you got to remember your story. You need to go back to some things that are key to your story. And so I'm going to tell our story tonight, but they're kind of interwoven with a few other stories as well. 
So the three stories I'm going to be talking a little bit about are, one, uh, the story of the Moravian prayer movement out of Hernhut that took place in the 1700s. Anybody ever heard of that? Give me a, any, any, a couple of us. Okay, good. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the story of the 24-7 prayer movement. Uh, that was the one that was birthed out of England, led by uh, Pete Gregg. Uh, that began in 1999. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how all of those things kind of tie together into the story of some of the prayer journey we've been on at Third Church, and in particular, um, how it relates to the lighthouse and uh, a vision to be a night and day praying community. All right? Sound good? Okay. Now, I have to start off by saying it's going to kill me because I have to give you such abridged versions of all these great stories. And so um, I'm totally a book nerd and dork. So if you want to know more about all these great things, I also have books for you at the end of the night. So, all right. So I'm going to start an attempt to weave these together uh, back in the early 2000s. So like I said, that's when I came on staff here. Um, at that time, my role, I was full-time in our student ministry, working specifically uh, with junior high students. And there was this book that came around in this season called Red Moon Rising. Okay, Red Moon Rising, how 24-7 prayer is awakening a generation. And so what happened is uh, my husband's on staff with InterVarsity. We were at this... Um, gathering. We had a guest speaker come in. He read like one page out of this book called The Vision and the Vow. And we were both like, what is this book? Like, this is incredible. So, um, of course, I jumped online and ordered it. And uh, I was the first one to read it. And we started, I started reading it in the car on the way to Des Moines. Um, John was listening to a Cardinals baseball game, which I could care less about. And I got five pages into the book and I just reached over and I shut off the stereo. And I was like, John, you have got to hear this. So he had no choice. And I began to read this book out loud to him. And what this book chronicles is this prayer movement that was birthed in England. Uh, like I said, that started in 1999, okay? Red Moon Rising. And now if you worship, I'll get into a little more of the story, with us regularly, you'll recognize Pete Gregg's name. So he's actually had a lot of um, fingerprints on our journey uh, here at Third. Recent, most recently, we've done it, the prayer course. Uh, God on Mute is a really powerful book by him. Electio 365 which we had encouraged our community to engage with in this season. That's all 24-7 prayer, the one that's birthed out of, uh, that was birthed out of um, England. Um, if you do the Night Watch, Pete is the lovely English male voice that um, helps you wrap up your day. And I, uh, yeah, just appreciate, he's got, he's a great reader. So anywho, um, I'm going to try and not go into too many rabbit trails tonight. Uh, so, uh, anywho, so the 24-7 prayer movement started as this experiment to see if Pete's church could pray nonstop kind of relay style for one whole month. And he talks about, like, this was an audacious goal because at the time he, he said the only people that came to a prayer meeting, so he has some weird line about, like, two old ladies being a goat or something. And so they were not a praying church. This was not something that uh, was really a part of their uh, DNA. And so to understand why they'd even embark on a journey like this, this is where we need to back up a little further uh, to the story of the Moravians in Hernhut. So uh, when Pete was in his early 20s, he had uh, been on kind of an adventure sort of post-graduation. And when he was on the, where was he? He was in Portugal. I'm really bad with geography. As far west as he could be. Um, in Europe, he got up one night during the night and he just began to pray. And he started just praying because um, he was as far west as you could be in Europe. So he starts praying back towards all of Europe. And as he's praying, he has this, he gets this sense like he's struck with the electricity. His body begins to like uh, feel like it's being electrocuted under the power of God. He has this open vision and he sees these armies 
of young people just rising up all throughout Europe with a passion for Jesus. And um, so he's a little bit undone by that, but it was one of those things, it was so crazy, he kind of tucked it away for a little while, pondered it, held on to it, like, Lord, what, what was that? And what are you going to do with this? So fast forward, it had been several years, he'd been kind of a successful church planter, things were going pretty good, but he just, he wasn't seeing the army. He wasn't, he didn't see what he felt like, um, God had shown him, and he was getting restless in ministry. That happens to us. We get restless in ministry. So he goes on kind of a wild goose chase, he says, all around Eastern uh, Europe. And one of his stops is in the uh, uh, Moravian uh, village of Hernhut. And he begins to, he'd known about their story, but it was a really impactful time there. And so uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Moravians in Hernhut, um, there was about a small, uh, it was just a small group of about 300 um, really Christian refugees. They had gotten kicked out of their lands uh, for how they were worshiping God. Um, and they landed, uh, they got permission to live on this property of a wealthy nobleman named Count Zivzendorf. And he had this property in this little village of Hernhut in Germany. And um, I'm, again, I'm giving you a very short story of their movement. But uh, there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that happens over this community. It was during kind of a, a season, actually, of repentance and reconciliation. The Holy Spirit falls, and they uh, begin to pray. They organi organize themselves into, like, groups of, like, three or four men and three or four women. They're assigned certain hours of the week that they're to pray, and they start praying night and day in this little community. And this little community went on to pray night and day, nonstop for 100 years straight, all right? Now, um, in and of itself, that's a pretty big God thing. Uh, but in addition to uh, praying nonstop for over 100 years, what happens is when you spend that much time in the presence of God, you can't help but get God's heart. And so they began to get a heart to see the gospel taken uh, to every tribe and nation in tongue. And so they began to, they were really, uh, some would credit them as the founders of um, kind of the most recent missionary movement of lay people. Because of, at that time, you know, maybe monks and nuns were doing missionary work, but this was lay people, everyday people like you and me that were getting inspired to take the gospel to the nations. And so in the first 65 years that they prayed, they sent out over 300 people um, all around the earth to different nations with the gospel. And, you know, the 1700s were not like today. You know, they didn't just jump on a plane and head, you know, like, I'm going to this place. Like, their first goal was just to arrive alive, right? To get to the place that they were going to be taking the gospel message to. And they had such a radical um, love and passion for Jesus that there was stories of um, men who would sell themselves literally into slavery, so that they would have access uh, to the slaves that were um, uh, on the Caribbean islands so that they could bear witness to Jesus there and um, so that Jesus would receive his full reward. Um, they went on to influence many people. So John Wesley uh, had his heart strangely warmed where he had an encounter with the Holy Spirit at a Moravian prayer movement. And it was obviously after that that he would go on uh, to be a part of starting the First Great Awakening. So their fingerprints, this tiny little community, um, enormous. I mean, just crazy. And so... Um, so Pete was inspired by that. That's the long, short story of that, guys. <laughs> and so here's this community that God um, inspired to pray radically, sent on mission radically, and that began to actually capture Pete's heart when he was on this journey. So he goes back and says, like, well, I don't know if we're up for 100 years, but let's try a month, okay? And so uh, they launch a prayer room. Uh, their goal is just to pray for one month straight. Now, these prayer rooms were a little bit different than normal prayer. It was designed to be kind of a multi-sensory, 
interactive experience um, with stations, writing on the wall, worship. So it felt like you were living and breathing kind of the prayer around you. And um, it wasn't long, uh, this thing like took off like crazy. And um, what Pete thought would only last one month is now 22 22 years later? Yeah, 22 years later, still happening literally all around the earth. Um, crazy enough, here's one tiny, just a mini rabbit trail, you guys. Two weeks after 24-7 uh, launched in England, um, IHOP in Kansas City launched, their, launched um, September 17th, I think, 1999, their night and day prayer room. So two weeks apart, these two massive night and day intercessory movements, they had zero to do with each other in the natural, but just a picture of what the Holy Spirit was raising up um, in this time, okay? So we get a hold of this book and all these things that are happening in, in their prayer room in England and then all these prayer rooms that were getting uh, just birthed around the world and we're like, this is incredible. It was very much linked to young people, to kids. People were getting healed and saved and delivered and having a passion for evangelism. And people that sometimes could barely spend like three minutes in prayer would be spending hours in prayer in the prayer room. And so um, at the time, as we were working with students, we were like, well, let's try this. Uh, you know, there was a beautiful thing happening in the larger body here at Third that there was a hunger growing for the more of God, a, a hunger for the Holy Spirit. And so we just decided uh, to build a prayer room like this and try and do some weekends of like unbroken prayer with our junior high and high school students. And um, we built our first one um, down in the actual boiler room of the church. So what a weird place, right, to build a prayer room. And there is a story why it's connected to that. But anywho, so we, you know, string the Christmas lights and put out the white paper and put markers and have trees that are, you can put prayers for healing and all these kind of different ways to pray. And then we just decide to like have our first weekend. And we have hundreds of kids come through and pray through this weekend. We are just shocked by how much the kids are um, like just diving into what God is doing in this prayer room. And then we, um, and then we would come in in the morning and we would find kids before school down in the, in the prayer room. And we'd come after school and we'd find kids just had come in their own and they were spending time just hanging out with God and they were worshiping and they were in the prayer room and it was just unbelievable. And it just kind of kept going and going. And um, so multiple times that, that year, we would host these uh, weekends of prayer and we would have 300 students uh, pray in, this, in these spaces in a weekend. And um, then funny story, we got shut down because evidently the fire chief told us, you can't actually have a prayer room in a boiler room. That's not safe. And so we just were like, hey, no problem. So we moved the prayer room to basically a giant closet, which a, big, a really big closet, and we just kept praying. And one of the fun things about these rooms is we just gave kids markers and said, you can write wherever you want. You can write prayers, you can write scriptures. And so I remember taking a shift um, kind of in one of our first weekends and I got in the room and I was like, oh my goodness. I mean, they were, there were prayer everywhere. I was like, how in the world did they get that high up on the ceiling? Um, this was like, the building was like brand new, you guys. And they had written like all over the backs of the doors. And we were like, we're going to be in so much trouble because <laughs> they're writing with permanent marker everywhere. But it was also amazing because these rooms would just come alive with prayers and scriptures. And then um, the adults started getting in on it too, which was fun. And um, because it was just this one room down in the middle of kind of nowhere in phase two, um, people would, we would say, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. And then you would know someone was in there praying because there would always be shoes outside the door. And so it was so sweet. Night and day, all different hours, um, people were heading into that space just to be, there was just this hunger uh, to be with God. Okay. So um, obviously we felt like the Holy Spirit was up to something in the midst of that. And it happened to be in that season that we were just about ready to build phase three of the building here. So if you don't know, the whole church was built phase one, phase two, phase three. 
So before phase two was built, Marty Schmidt and I had to carry all of our stuff, you guys, to the cafeteria over at the elementary school every Sunday for junior high Sunday school. So we were really glad when it got done. But anywho, when phase three came, that would be basically everything kind of from the place of prayer this way. When we were designing it, it was supposed to have a gym because, you know, that's what churches were doing then. You're building gyms. Gyms are good places to hang out, have, have services, you know, kind of a multifunctional space. But um, when we saw what God was kind of doing in the larger community here and adults and students around prayer, um, our leadership kind of felt like we're not supposed to build a gym. We're supposed to build a space that is dedicated to prayer here. And so um, what happened is we just decided to scrap the plans for the gym and um, we, uh, I, I should, Camille would probably have these details better. I think it was Lane, actually, Pastor Kevin's wife, who first had this sense that it was supposed to be a lighthouse of prayer. But when you tell an architect that you would like to build a lighthouse of prayer, they don't have a clue what you're talking about, right? Nobody had built a lighthouse of prayer, I don't think, and they hadn't built a lighthouse of prayer before. And so um, there was a team that was working on kind of the design for this space, and my friend Camille was on that, and she actually received kind of an image from the Lord um, of what this space could look like. She sculpted it out, kind of gave it to the architects, and that began to... That began to be the thing that inspired um, the design and the build of the lighthouse of prayer that we have here. And so, um, okay, I'm kind of all over the place, so i got to catch myself here. And so... um, we, we move the kids now. We were like, we want the kids like right in the basement. We want them still kind of at the foundation of prayer uh, in that space. So we gave the kids the basement, created kind of a student space in there. And then um, what you see now, we had uh, different areas of the lighthouse designed for different uh, ways to spend time with God, to intercede with God, um, to interact with God. And so, um, and I'll just tell you from my own experience, we, uh, we saw this connection between prayer and mission in that season. We had multiple students who right from high school said, um, we don't feel like college is for us in this season. And they went right to YWAM bases. They spent time with YWAM. They got sent to the nations. We had multiple leaders who were leading with us in student ministry quit their jobs and go into um, missions full time in this, that season. Um, God was just doing this powerful work amongst us um, in both prayer and in mission. Uh, who, who would have been a part of that season? Raise your hand. You guys, Sorheims, I was going to say, I know you were in there. Anybody else who were in those original days? Yeah, yeah, Mike. Mike's been here a long time, just like me. So he was in the midst of all that too. Mike has really good handwriting too, you guys. And so he, he would do really good stuff in the prayer room when we needed things, just as a side note. So anywho, um, I share all of this with you tonight um, because um, I feel, like I said, like, the Lord was like, it's time to remember your story a little bit. It's time to relight some of the fire of prayer that that space was intended for. I mean, it's a great space to go for personal quiet times and devotions, but I think that that space, the vision for that space was so, uh, so much bigger. It's so much bigger. And so, um, I really think that uh, God is just saying, um, and I don't know that it's going to look identical to what it did 20 years ago, but I just feel like now's the time to really prioritize the presence in that space. And one of the things that I love uh, about Red Moon Rising or about this original um, kind of the way they talked about this marriage of prayer and mission is they were saying it's like breathing. It's like breathing it with God, right? We breathe in intimacy, that connection, that communion, that presence, so that we can go and breathe out, right? Uh, His presence, evangelism, um, just love of neighbor, um, signs and wonders and miracles. I mean, those are all part of what God does when we saturate ourselves in his 
presence. And so I've just been journaling a ton over uh, the past year. And so um, just thinking a lot about these kind of coming and going phrases. And so when I think about describing the community that I think the Lord wants to raise up here, I, yeah, I love that intimacy and involvement uh, as both legs of the gospel. I love um, harvest preparation where we're contending for the lost, but also harvest work, right? Where we're out in the fields, you know, there was a, a leader we heard at a conference that said uh, this week, the problem has never been the fields being ripe. It's, it's been that there have not been enough harvesters. And so we are, we're praying both for harvest preparation and to be harvest workers. Um, I think about our prayers being from heaven to earth and earth to heaven. I think about space spent listening quietly, but also speaking and contending. Um, I love the idea of the coming and going. Uh, I think there's something about it being individual, but also communal. There's something so powerful about being a part of a community who's going after the presence of God together. It was my favorite thing to um, come in at a night watch at one in the morning and to, to switch places with someone and just know that you were hungry for God's presence together. And you were a part of a community that was hungry for God's presence together. So there's something powerful about, it is individual, but it's very much communal at the same time as well. And, and I think for us, um, it's gonna be all kinds of streams of prayer here, from contemplative and intercessory to um, prophetic and healing. I think there'll be creativity. And so um, I love that we're a, a church that's trying to embrace all kinds of different streams um, around prayer. And, and I think that there's space for all of that um, there. And, you know, one of the other things that's kind of been percolating in my heart over this past year is this idea of like uh, a kind of modern monasticism, right? So um, monasticism in some ways uh, started because when culture's going one way, right, there was a way that this uh, grounded uh, the monks and the people in like certain practices of God, kind of putting a stake in the ground. And so, um, and some of the, you know, different communities lived out the, the intimacy and the mission beautifully. And so I think that we're coming into a season as the flow of the culture goes this way, I think that the idea of a modern monastic community where um, coming and going from this space to stay rooted and grounded in the truths of the gospel is going to be essential. We can't just show up on uh, Sunday morning, listen passively, and expect to be people who light the culture on fire with the good news of the gospel. We're gonna have to be people of the presence. And so, um, so that's what I've been thinking about. So, <laughs> and so I, uh, I basically, you know, and I, I, I said to, to Tiff and Kathy this week, how do I communicate we're really supposed to do this, but it's not really an event, and I just want you to give your lives to this, okay? So, because that's kind of what I feel like, is that um, I'm not necessarily asking us for just a one-time event. I just feel like the Lord's saying, um, will you give me, will you prioritize my presence? Will you give me space? Will you watch with me? Will you wait with me? Will you believe that there's joy in my house of prayer? A house of prayer for all nations, just like Isaiah says. And so, um, you know, I, I was, you know, listening with the Holy Spirit, and I'm like, well, what is the invitation for now, though, right in this hour? And I felt like he said, um, start lighting the fire. Um, what if you filled the lighthouse with a thousand hours of prayer? between now and December 31st, so the remainder of 2021. And I was like, well, that's a good number, you know? I mean, if a few hundred people can pray for a uh, hundred years, I think we could pray for a thousand hours. And, and again, it's not necessarily about the thousand hours, right? But it's about saying, we're gonna order our lives about pri around prioritizing your presence because we wanna be able to carry that with us as we go out and we love our neighbors and we love the kids we're caring for at school and we love the people we're interacting with at Walmart. 
smart. And um, what will happen, you know, sometimes there's questions of like, well, why do I have to come to the lighthouse? You know, why can't I just pray by myself in my bedroom? And there, of course, you can pray by yourself in your bedroom, and you should. But um, there's something that happens, right? There is a thin space that will begin to happen when we fill a place with prayer and seeking God's face. And then what happens is when someone who maybe has a hard time hearing from Jesus walks in that space, it's like the, the heavens are open and they have an encounter with God. And we want to create a space where people who are coming and going from our church body said, I don't know what's going on in that space, but I know that God is in that place. And so there's something powerful when we locate our prayers in a place, in a space that no, not only is good for us, but there's something beautiful that can happen as people come in, in and out um, of that place together. And so, um, uh, yeah, I don't really even know, guys, but I think I just felt like we'll go really old school, and I'm just going to put something called, I didn't know what to call it, the Ignite Prayer Log. That's what we're calling it, and I'm putting a notebook, pieces of paper. We're not even going to use technology, and it's going to just be in a binder outside of the lighthouse, and if, uh, if you are open to this, I want to invite you um, in just a minute, we're going to uh, do some prayer and worship, but I'm going to invite you as a community, if you would like to say yes to this, to spending an hour a week uh, with the Lord in the lighthouse or two hours a month, whatever it is, let the Holy Spirit show you. Um, but I have cards up here. Um, I'd love for us to say, yes, I'm committing to this. This is going to be part of my practice, my rule of life, my rhythms with Jesus. And then um, I'll have your name and your email because I'll keep you up to date too. We're going to do a whole week of nonstop prayer, 24-7 prayer to launch season. We want, we want this community more and more for that to be a part of what we're doing. Uh, seasons of 24-7 prayer um, rhythms of that as we work towards, and, and I don't know, I don't know if the long-term vision is a hundred years of nonstop prayer, but we're going to start uh, at least with, we're going to start with a thousand. And so um, as I try and land the plane here a little bit <laughs> tonight, here's kind of the, the invitation. So um, worship team, go ahead and come on up. I really am close to being done here. Um, we're going to do a couple of things. Like I said, as we worship, uh, there are prayer cards up here. And if you want to be a part of just saying yes, I want to give the Lord this, uh, this space. I'm going to prioritize the presence. Um, there's just cards. You can fill it out and just put it in the baskets. Um, like I said, there's something, uh, this book, Red Moon Rising, just it captured our hearts. It captured our vision. And so Dirty Glory is just the same story of that movement, but about 10 years later, probably. And I mean, I, I just read it again in May, and it just wrecked me, guys, for just the stories of what God can do with um, when we just say, God, we're all in. We're all in to love you and to love people. So there's like, I don't know, 25 or 30 of these up here. Um, if you want to just grab one and take it and read it, and let's just cycle them through our community. When you're done with it, bring it back to the next 610 or drop it in my office, because I kind of want uh, this to circulate amongst us for you to catch kind of the larger vision. Um, if you're an audible person, Pete reads his own book, and he's such a good reader. And so I highly recommend that as well. But anyways, just if this is, feels like it's resonating with you, I want to encourage you um, to grab a book. And then finally, um, as we go into worship as well, we have some of our student prayer team here. Where are you? Where are you? Yay! Good. Um, I love that we have students praying here tonight because, um, like I said, students have always been right at the heart of prayer stuff for us here at Third. And so these students want to bless you tonight, and they're going to pray for two things. They're going to pray that you have face-to-face -face encounters with Jesus when you spend time in that lighthouse, and then they're going to pray that you have divine appointments when you leave it and you head out of this building into the streets. And so they want to pray a blessing blessing over you uh, tonight, and then we'll have some other prayer teams. If there's other things that you need prayer for, uh, we're going to pray over you. Um, and then, 
I think that's it. So, but to kind of wrap up this fine time, I felt like the Lord just uh, wanted us to like consecrate that space a little bit and to just to pray over the lighthouse as a community um, as we headed into worship and then respond a little bit more personally um, together. So um, if you'd be willing to just extend a hand actually towards the lighthouse. And we're just going to pray together for uh, that to be a, such a thin space in place for encounter with Jesus. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the stories that you're writing in this hour. We thank you for the prayer story you're writing for this community. Lord, we just say that we want to keep watch with you. You're worth it, Jesus. And so, Father, we just repent from any of the ways that we've strayed actually from our story. And we uh, we pray blessing over this lighthouse of prayer, Lord. And we indeed pray that it would become a a place for face-to-face encounter with you where hearts would be stirred to see the gospel taken to all nations, where bodies and minds would be healed and restored, where people would just have intimate, just uh, those love encounters with you, God. We pray that students would be just set on fire for your presence again, God, in that place, in that space. And so, Lord, we just welcome, we welcome the fullness of your presence to inhabit that space and place. We thank you for holy angels. We welcome them to minister, to war alongside of our intercession, to encourage us, to bring healing. God, everything that you have, Lord, we welcome it into that space, Lord. And as a community, Lord, we just say, uh, we give you our yes. We want to see you. We want to have face-to-face encounters with you, God. We want to prioritize your presence as a community. And Lord, we don't know. We don't know everything that you want to do, Jesus, but... Like my friend Vicky said tonight, we just say again, God, we're just all in. We're just all in. We don't want to hold anything back from you in this hour. God, the world does not need more of me. Lord, the world needs a face that has been in your presence and radiates your glory. And so Jesus, we just pray that you would stir up a passion for your presence and a deep love for your world amongst us. So we just pray these things together tonight in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So you're welcome to just respond as you feel led and to receive prayer.